Good evening, and welcome to the Night Gallery. Today, we're taking a trip back to one of the darker corners of 1970s TV, Rod Serling's Night Gallery. This series was the follow-up to Serling's classic, Twilight Zone. While that show explored morality and social commentary across various genres, Night Gallery was a different beast altogether. This show was far more focused on shocks, scares, and the macabre. Night Gallery featured prominent stars from the era, many in starring roles, and even a few familiar faces who showed up in minor parts. What's your name? Francis. Once again, Rod Serling took up hosting duties, although in this case he was more of a curator. Serling introduced each episode via a series of surreal paintings, all of which served as a harbinger of the horrors to come. Night Gallery aired for three seasons, from 1970 to 1973. Episodes were broken down into segments, many of which went on to become fan favorites. And with that in mind, dim your lights and settle in. What follows are my top 10 favorite Night Gallery segments. Let's begin with one of the more unsettling Night Gallery entries, A Question of Fear. This one starred Leslie Nielsen as Colonel Malloy, a tough-talking mercenary and disbeliever in the supernatural. At a private social club, Colonel Malloy listens on as a fellow club member, Dr. Mazi, reveals his terrifying ordeal in a haunted house. When I went in there, my hair was jet black. It was this color when I came out. Malloy is quick to accuse Dr. Mazi of being a coward, and this sets the stage for what's to come. Are you a betting man, Colonel Malloy? It depends. Dr. Mazi bets Malloy $15,000 he can't spend one night in the house without being frightened to death. For $15,000, I would survive a night in hell. With that, we're well on our way to some vintage ghostly action. In the abandoned home, which you may recognize as the Bates House from Psycho, Colonel Malloy encounters all kinds of nightmarish insanity. A question of fear delivers in terms of eerie visuals and a spooky soundscape filled with maniacal laughter. Malloy's adversary here, as played by Fritz Weaver, is in top form as always. You may recall him from The Twilight Zone and Creep Show. Speaking of which... Once again, we get to see Leslie Nielsen in full-on villainous Creep Show mode, complete with the mustache and eye patch. Signifying this guy really is evil incarnate. <laughs> you must be joking. While watching this, you may think you know what's ahead. <clears throat> but there are twists and turns that will keep you guessing until the end. Stand by to roll tape. One roll tape. Slate in. Three, two, one. Audition tape number 323, The Herbie Bittman Show. Up next, we have another standout segment, The Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes. This one starred one of the most recognizable character actors of the last 60 plus years, Clint Howard. Howard is famous for his many roles in TV and films, but Star Trek fans will likely recognize him as Balok, the small alien with a big laugh. <laughs> in this tale, Howard portrayed Herbie Bittman, a child with the ability to predict the future. Howard's performance here is solid, and he does an excellent job drawing us into this compelling story. Tomorrow morning, at about one minute till six, there'll be an earthquake in the Los Angeles area. Herbie's journey to stardom is also interesting. Initially, his loudest critic is a hot-headed network TV exec, Mr. Wellman, as played by Michael Constantine. You want to put a ten-year-old myopic who sits on pillows and tells fright stories? But after one of Herbie's predictions come true, Wellman changes his tune. I can't help but wonder how much this depiction of a nasty network bigwig parallels Serling's own experiences with similar individuals. Anyway, the real intrigue in this segment are themes such as the nature of foresight and the moral dilemmas such power demands. The real question being, is Herbie's ability to predict the future a gift or a curse? The next two entries on my list cover similar themes and they're close in spirit to Twilight Zone, but both remain true to the vibe of Night Gallery. First, we have You Can't Get Help Like That Anymore, 
a creepy, futuristic tale about robotic domestic servants. This segment starred two highly acclaimed Academy Award winners, Cloris Leachman and Broderick Crawford, as Mr. and Miss Fulton. The Fultons are in need of a new maid, but what they probably need a lot more is mental help. As we quickly learn, these two are actually sadistic monsters with the history of abusing and torturing their robotic servants. All the major circuits torn out. All the limbs dismembered and fractured. This segment does echo similar sci-fi tales, and it begs the question, what makes something human beyond mere appearance and behavior? What did you ever kick, punch, and abuse before we developed robots for you? Although robotic servants are central to the story, the deeper exploration is the ugliness of humanity. And this issue takes center stage when the Fulton's new maid, as played by Lana Wood, enters the picture. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It doesn't take long for the couple to fall back into their terrible behavior. If you wanted a robot aide whose functions were more complicated, that's foolish. Beyond the subtext, what keeps you on the edge of your seat this time around is wondering how far this couple will go and how much the new maid is willing to endure. This is rather an anointed day at our university. The occasion of the oral section of your final examination. Next up, we have Class of 99. This one stars the legendary Vincent Price. I wish you all very good luck. Price actually had two appearances in Night Gallery, his other being the very trippy The Return of the Sorcerer, an H.P. Lovecraft adaptation complete with Supper Time with a Goat. Class of 99 isn't as wacky as that segment, but this entry is still pretty out there. The story opens with college students taking their final exam. What was Roger Bacon called, Mr. McQuirter? English powder monk. Now, these initial queries don't necessarily seem out of the ordinary, but we get a hint that things are off when a student is only able to partially answer his question. I gave you three out of four, and in giving me three out of four, you proved yourself incompetent. The tense interaction between the student and professor makes it crystal clear there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. At this point in the segment, you may wonder if perhaps this is another one of Serling's meditations on conformity. But as the examination continues into the behavioral sciences section, we descend into some unsettling territory. Look at Mr. Barnes to your right. He's black. And being black may pose a special problem. But he might be pushy, aggressive. The professor's questions shift toward race and social class. Tends towards snobbery. White trash. Ignorant. No graces. The segment goes back and forth with these intense social conflicts until an escalation becomes inevitable. Bigoted. Aggressive. Preset prejudices. Class of 99 is another shiny example of Serling weighing in on subjects he had strong feelings about, with the backdrop of higher education serving as an ideal fit for the narrative. I also like that this time around, Serling was far more bold in his approach, but just as clever as ever. Our next segment, Tell David, is one of the weirder entries on my list. But that's not to say this is the weirdest segment in the series. There's plenty of other stories that would jump ahead in that area. Tell David stars Sandra D as Anne Bolt. Up front, she finds herself lost in a thunderstorm. She stops at a house to use the phone and is greeted by a woman named Pat Blessington. Would you like some coffee? It's already made. Now, one curious aspect of this opening is the home is filled with some impressive technology for the time. There's a FaceTime-like phone, and later we even see an electronic map, akin to our modern Google Maps. There it is, man. That's the quickest route. But it wasn't just the tech that seemed out of place. What really grabbed me was the fact that this couple led a total stranger into their home. I've seen more than enough horror movies to know situations like this usually go pretty bad. But this strange setup and the possibility of where this story could go kept me hooked. Thankfully, the segment maintains steady momentum, offering up even more curveballs along the way. You're late! Is that how I sound to you? Another highlight of Tell David is the solid performance from Sandra D. She's best known for her role in Gidget, a movie credited with kickstarting the beach party and surfer craze and horror fans will recall her from yet another H.P. Lovecraft adaptation, The Dunwich Horror. What do you want to hear, Anne, that I'm keeping some woman on the side? The key aspect in this story is Anne's strained marriage. But the puzzle we're left to piece together is how her troubled home life intersects with this uncanny couple who dwell in a futuristic house. 
Now, some viewers may be like Herbie Bittman and able to predict where this one is going. There'll be some damage and some fatalities as well. On my first watch, the story kept me guessing. Maybe I could have used a map myself to figure things out. In any case, I still think the strong performances and the bizarre journey makes Tell David worth the price of admission. I've been good. Miss Danton says I've been good. And I have a new doll. Up next, we have a story about a doll that looks like it was handcrafted by Satan himself. The doll stars John Williams, who is best known for his role in Dial M for Murder, and a ton of other work with Alfred Hitchcock. Here he plays British Colonel Heimber Masters. After being away on a long trip, Masters arrives home to discover that someone has sent a very strange doll to his house. Unfortunately, his niece Monica, as played by Jewel Blanche, has taken a liking to this little abomination. Monica keeps the doll with her at all times, and as evil dolls are known to do, apparently it even speaks to her. She talks to me about all kinds of things, especially you. She must be very fond of you, Uncle. Set during the British era of colonialism, this story is a welcome change-up from many of the other contemporary tales in Night Gallery. This one offers up a bleak and eerie atmosphere throughout. As far as the creepy doll goes, I actually like that we skip by any notions that this thing could be innocent. And who gave you that? Sir, I assumed you did. From the first moment Masters sees the doll, it's obvious. He's as disturbed by it as we are. The doll's eyes are blackened around the edges. Its skin looks like it's been peeled off a cadaver. You just know this thing has a taste for blood. She speaks to me all the time. Mostly at night. Eventually, we discover there's a unique backstory tied to the doll and some rather dark history that also comes into play, all of which unfolds at a perfect pace and keeps you hooked. At some point, pretty much every horror anthology series out there features a creepy doll of some sort. So it was great to see Night Gallery's take on this formula. It's no surprise the doll is a fan favorite. Your senses. So alert, so aware. I think I like you because you're different from the others. The others? Other champions. Stepping away from pure horror for just a second, our next segment is The Ring with the Red Velvet Ropes. What this one lacks in scares, it makes up for with an eerie, dreamlike atmosphere and a thought-provoking narrative. The segment stars Gary Lockwood as Jim Figg, a heavyweight boxer fresh off winning the world championship title. Now, as a fan of boxing stories, it was easy for me to get into this one. But another aspect that helps is the story makes the jump into crazy territory very early on. Jim barely has a moment to celebrate his victory before he gets a strange visit from the man he just defeated. Champion. You just think you're a champion. Shortly thereafter, Jim finds himself somehow transported to this strange, ritzy hotel. Apparently, he's been summoned by Mr. and Mrs. Blanco. Sandra Blanco, as played by Joan Van Ark, tells Jim he has to fight her husband, a former undefeated champion. You'll not leave here, Fig, until you've met me in the ring. Mr. Blanco is portrayed extremely well by Chuck Connors, who offers up a nuanced performance. Talk to my manager. Don't you understand anything, Fig? No managers, no crowds, no public displays. Sports fans will recall Connors was one of only 13 athletes in history to have played in both Major League Baseball and the NBA. Connors' work in television and films spanned decades, his most iconic role being the lead in The Rifleman, and he also had notable parts in Soylent Green and Tourist Trap. This segment features strong performances all around, including a brief but memorable cameo from G2 Kumbuka. You may recognize him from Hall of Nights and countless roles in film and TV as well. I have tweaked your imagination, Fig. A rare accomplishment, I expect. The key aspect of this segment is the ambiguity. Nothing is fully spelled out for us. But elements such as the Ring of Fire and this bizarre setting, which seemingly exists out of time, suggest possible deeper meanings in this scenario. And it's also telling that, at the heart of it all, we have two champions who exemplify one of Shakespeare's more infamous quotes, Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Those of you who can't stand creepy crawlers, brace yourselves. The Caterpillar may be a tough watch. The Caterpillar stars Lawrence Harvey, who's best known for his role in The Manchurian Candidate. And it also features Night Gallery veteran Joanna Pettit who you may know from The Evil, a horror gem I discussed right here on the channel. Set in the jungles of Borneo, we're introduced to British civil servant Stephen Macy. 
Macy left Britain to escape boredom, but in Borneo, all he finds is more boredom. And rain. Lots and lots of rain. Does it never stop raining? Sometime in March. This is one miserable guy, but misery loves company, and the company Macy desires is Rona. How about you, Macy? An appetite? Slowly growing. Rona is the younger wife of his commanding officer, Colonel Warwick, as played by Tom Helmore. The couple are deeply in love, but that doesn't stop Macy from pursuing her. I have a suggestion. A friendly suggestion. Take a cold bath, Mr. Macy. One cold bath later, a thoroughly rejected Stephen plots with the fellow British expatriate on how to get Rona's husband out of the picture. And that brings us to the topic of the day, deadly earwigs. Now, if you were to place one of these earwigs in a man's hair, it's a thousand to one chance of it ever coming out the same way again. Apparently, the carnivorous earwig is capable of crawling into people's ears and slowly devouring their brains. It's a living torment is what it is. Torture. But the net result, oh, there's the beauty of it. I'll avoid going into further details about this one, but needless to say, we do get some earwig action, and the pain caused by the creature is excruciating. For obvious reasons, the caterpillar is widely regarded as one of Night Gallery's most disturbing segments. Next up, we have another fan favorite, The Cemetery. This was the renowned pilot that launched the series. Many fans rank this segment very high on their lists, and obviously, I'm in agreement. I have spent a good deal of my life acquiring a taste for the good life, but somehow never acquiring the means. How sad, sir. The Cemetery stars the legendary Roddy McDowell, who's best known for roles in The Planet of the Apes, Fright Night, and countless performances spanning over 60 years. Here, McDowell delivers an unforgettable performance as Jeremy Evans, a selfish black sheep nephew with his sights set on the fortune of his rich uncle. Voila! Isn't that refreshing, uncle? With his uncle's health in severe decline, Jeremy makes sure to park his wheelchair right in front of the breeziest window he can find. Drink it all in, uncle, like a new tenant investigating his new abode. Shortly thereafter, Jeremy's uncle passes away, he inherits the family estate, and our journey into creepy territory begins. Hey, look at this. Look at what, sir? The picture, the paint, stupid. Look at it. In this case, Jeremy's nightmare plays out as he's haunted by one of his uncle's ever-changing paintings. I see nothing wrong, sir. The cemetery is a dark and thoroughly entertaining story, and I love that it keeps us in suspense and questioning what's truly happening. Is Jeremy simply going mad, or is his uncle actually seeking vengeance from beyond the grave? I am a scoundrel, am I not? You're a swine, sir. Another highlight here is the ongoing conflict between Jeremy and his uncle's butler, Portafoy, a name we hear a whole lot in this story. Would you care to pay your last respects, Portafoy? Why do you load it up that way, Portafoy? Tell me, Portafoy. Portafoy. Oh, Portafoy. 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 <laughs> well on it, Portafoy. Portafoy is played very well by Ozzie Davis, who's best known for his work in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, Jungle Fever, and the cult classic Bubba Hotep. The Cemetery represents some of Serling's finest writing in Night Gallery. The story is filled with clever twists and turns. Guaranteed, this one will stick with you. What are you going to do with yourself? Taking Aunt Ada for a ride. <sighs> Aunt Ada, huh? Aunt Ada. Bye. And that takes us to my favorite Night Gallery segment, Since Aunt Ada Came to Stay. This story is about a professor who discovers his wife's visiting aunt may be a witch. What's this stuff? Oh, that herbs, dearie. Herbs to help her sleep. This one stars James Farentino and his then real-life wife, Michelle Lee, as Craig and Joanna Lowell, a young couple who have no idea of the hell they're about to endure. It's not going to be much longer. <laughs> we soon learn Aunt Ada is far more than just some innocent elderly relative. She reeks of witchcraft and very clearly has some sinister plans brewing. Aunt Ada was played extremely well by Jeanette Nolan, an acclaimed actress with an impressive career in film and television. 
Interestingly, this wasn't her first go-around in a role like this. She played similar parts in Boris Karloff's Thriller and in Twilight Zone. You have seen my picture in the family album. Far more than just some ghoulish threat looming in the shadows, Aunt Ada is downright terrifying. She has tons of tricks up her sleeves, and when she springs into action, all hell breaks loose. What are you after? I will have an answer! <laughs> A good portion of this segment involves Craig struggling to figure out what Aunt Data wants from them. This intense conflict is central, pitting rationality against ancient dark forces. Farentino, who I mainly know from another 80s horror gem, Dead and Buried, does really well here as our skeptical lead, forced into this nightmare scenario. Disbelieve if you will, my friend, but also do not forget. Thankfully, he does get some help from Lost in Space veteran Jonathan Harris, who portrays the oddball professor Nick Porteous. He's the occult expert and go-to guy when it comes to witch infestations. For those of you seeking vintage horror, this segment offers up more than enough creepy witchcraft and chilling moments. Craig, you're frightening me to death. No, I'm fighting to keep you alive. So, there we have it. Ten of my favorite Night Gallery segments. Thanks for watching everyone, I appreciate it, and I hope you enjoyed this trip back to Rod Serling's Night Gallery. There's a lot of other favorites, so who knows, maybe we'll revisit this topic one day and I'll spotlight even more segments. In the meantime, feel free to comment about some of your favorite segments below. Don't forget, hit like and sub. Until next time, take care, later.